We've just completed our updated edition of our top 50 best books of all time. You can be one of the first to grab this new list. We've taken the hundreds of books that we've read and selected and ranked the best books and given a little bit of a slice of what you might learn from these books. That's it, man. So we've done a little write-up in each one of the 50 books. So it's going to be a really quick read for you. But what you're going to learn in a very short period of time is a little bit about 50 different books that we that were the best for us. And I could almost guarantee that it will be at least a handful of them which are going to be perfect for you. Head to whatyouwillearn.com slash top 50. That's T-O-P-5-0. And you can be one of the first to grab our top 50 best books of all time. Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we are reviewing The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham, the definitive book on value investing. Benjamin Graham, known as uh, the father of investing on uh, one quick Google search I just did, but he was Warren Buffett's mentor and Warren Buffett did extremely well in investing. He sure did. And uh, to learn from Warren Buffett's mentor is uh, probably a pretty good person to learn from. Oh, yeah. So, you can learn something from this book if you want to be like Warren Buffett where you spend a lot of your time and energy in learning how to invest and investing in the right things. But he also lays out the framework to be someone who just does it on the weekends, also known as the defensive investor in the book. And all you need to do really is just follow simple frameworks. Yeah, and that's the difference. He says that it's not, you don't need any stratospheric IQ or unusual business insights or inside information to become successful at investing over your lifetime. You just need these frameworks. So they're these sound intellectual frameworks for making decisions. And mixed in with that, you need the, uh, to keep your emotions in check to avoid you from violating those frameworks. Because really the market is and can be very irrational. It's just like the the mass of the population's thoughts about stocks and so forth. So when they're being silly and irrational, you can jump in at the right times and buy things at a really good value for the what the real intrinsic value of that uh, asset is. Yeah, if you've got your rules and you stick to them, you can see when the market is going really exuberant over the top or really pessimistic and undervaluing everything. And if you've got your rules, you can see when that irrationality has happened and taking advantage of that for yourself. So, mate, the book's full of lessons and frameworks and guidelines and philosophies to really follow when it comes to investing. And the start of the book, he talks about what the difference is between investment and speculation. It's extremely important to differentiate these two and distinguish between the two. And it's important to know when you're investing and when you're speculating. And when you're speculating, don't pretend that you're investing. So he says that speculation involves hoping that someone will pay more at a later date. So it's basically buying things based on your hoping that the price is going to go up and somebody else is going to buy it at a higher price than you. And he says that you should really keep your portfolio to less than 10% speculation. So when you invest in a stock or a bond or, or real estate or anything like that, it's really always got some kind of metric that you can follow. It really indicates the real value of what you're buying and then it might give you some kind of yield or return and then you know if that metric is way out of whack, then you might be in the speculative waters where people are just buying it out of hope that someone else is going to pay more for it in the future. So you might look at the tech boom and we're going to learn about P on E ratios a bit later, but it got to the sky, the stratosphere is people thinking the internet's going to change everything. So people were speculating that that was going to be true. People can speculate in property sometimes saying, you know, property only ever goes up. But when you ask them, you know, what's the metric they're looking at, it might be rental yields and no one even looks at that, these people who speculate and so forth. So it, it, it comes in different forms. Also, Bitcoin, again, there might not be an inherent value in it, according to some people. Um, but, you know, when people buy it, they're just buying it purely because they're hoping someone else will pay more for it in the future. Yeah, and you might be listening thinking, hang on, isn't the point always to buy something so that the price goes up and you sell it for higher later? But that's uh, what he's differentiating in terms of investment. It's more looking at the intrinsic value and the, I guess, the returns that you're going to get from it. So from stocks, you're going to be getting dividends. So investing would be buying things where the dividends are consistent over time and are growing over time. And you're not looking at the price so much to go up in terms of the capital. Same as like bonds, you're looking at those coupon payments for a property, you're looking at those rental payments. So he talks a lot about the uh, returns that you're going to get rather than just speculating, which is just buying, hoping it's going to go up quickly. 
So bang on, man. That's really cool. There's a whole, as we said, it laid out, there's a whole different array of ways you can speculate. But a big part of it people do is trading in the market. And there's a whole bunch of ridiculous magic techniques people think they're following to actually beat the market. Yeah, he really knocks a few on the head. There's one called the Foolish Four, um, which is the Motley Fool sort of promoted this idea. And uh, I actually subscribed to the Motley Fool for a couple of years. <laughs> um, never did this one. But basically, they said they found this awesome idea. And what you do is you in the top 100 companies, you find the top five with the highest dividend yield. You throw away the one with the lowest price. You put 40% of your portfolio in the second lowest price and 20% of your portfolio in the other three remaining. And then one year later, you reassess, find the top five, sell what isn't in there anymore, buy what's now in there, and basically you're going to make a fuckload of money. They said that <laughs> in 20 years, you'll turn your $20,000 into $1.8 million based mm. on their stats. Oh. Man, it sounds phenomenal. <laughs> but then... They did a study and it never worked. Didn't work, yeah, mate. <laughs> it's like if you look at any data points like long enough, you've got so much data about trading and in the market, there's a huge number of patterns can emerge. They just like found this one cheeky pattern that happened over 20 years and and just assumed it's going to happen for the next 20 years. Even though, you know, if you really look at a million different patterns, maybe five of them are going to be amazing for the past 20 years. Yeah, exactly. And if you if there's just a whole bunch of different things and you happen to see one and then you probably you probably go back a year or two and think, what the hell, it's still working. Then you go back 30 years and you're like, oh my mm. God, this is, the, this is the answer, I've solved it. But then it's just, you just got lucky. Mate, there's another <laughs> one I really like by a dude called uh, Greg Secker. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, he, he rocked up. Me and you went to some like seminar <laughs> when we were a bit younger and he was like claiming and showing all these stories of these young 23-year-old uh, woman getting rich in two years just by trading and following this formula and then there was another footage of him you know buying his dad a Lamborghini and going and choppers or whatever from this magic formula then he said then he pitched a five grand course and he thought fuck well, you thought you know what's five grand if I'm going to be flying choppers Super in two rich. years so Mate, tell well, me about this strategy well, and how it the, went yeah. <laughs> this is a for foreign exchange trading you have the euro bear strategy and you know if it you keep an eye on it at, say, 5 p.m. Australian time when it's the European markets are open, that the euro is going to go up um, 10 pips and then it's going to go up another 10 pips and then it's going to go up another 10 pips the next hour and then bang, it's going to drop the euro bear. Choppers. <laughs> 40, it's going to drop 40 pips. If you sell it, you're going to make a fuckload of money and basically you're going to get rich. Yeah, Lambos and choppers. <laughs> so I'd, uh, in summary, probably don't follow the euro bear. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it, Didn't man. It's yet. like... A lot of people have got these strategies, but uh, you know they're just patterns that emerge over the past. They're not going to work again in the future. And the other reason it's probably not going to work is the efficient market hypothesis. And this is the theory that the price of a stock or any publicly traded, um, you know, something on the market, it's already priced in all the publicly available information. Mm. Uh, it's not like Greg Secker, this dude's got this yeah. special information that no one else does. Everything's already baked into what the price is. Exactly. Another big one he talks about is the cash on the calendar effect or the January effect. So say in, in the US specifically that at the end of the year, people are selling their shit stocks to get rid of them and claim the loss on their tax. Uh, so there was the idea that all these shitty stocks that weren't going so well, they're going to be sold a lot. They're going to be oversold and their price is going to go down below what it should. And then if you can go in and buy these shitty stocks at the end of December, and then when in January, when everyone comes back in, they've claimed the tax, 30 days later, they're allowed to buy it back again, they're going to buy it back and it goes up. And this was pretty legit for a period of time until everybody started to see it. And then when everybody saw it, then they started buying it a couple of weeks earlier, and then they bought it a couple of weeks earlier. And it basically, once everybody knew about it, it disappeared because everyone's trying to do it and it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, that's a great example, man. As soon as everyone started writing books with it yeah. about it and people learned more about it, all of a sudden it wasn't undervalued, this this uh, strategy, right? So everyone knew about it, so there everyone started doing it. And then it was baked in the price, and if not, probably overpriced around the January effect. So it went the other mm. way. Yeah, exactly. So in basically, in summary, if someone's got a magic formula or the one technique that you need to make a million dollars, then it's probably... Uh, in fact, almost definitely not going to work. Yeah, yeah. Speaking so, from personal experience. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Benjamin Graham, he brings it down to earth and you know, you got to focus on the real reasons why you're buying a stock. You're really buying a business that has some kind of yield, is profitable, has assets and all these positive things which we'll get into later. So it's a 500-page banger and he covers a little bit about uh, you know, originality and some basics about when you're getting in investing and 
uh, one of the reasons you you might invest in the first place is to beat inflation. Yeah, and inflation is obviously prices going up all the time. And if you think you can invest and get more than inflation, then obviously you're you're winning, I guess. But you've got to be careful in the difference between your nominal return and your real return. If you've got a 2% pay rise at your job, uh, you probably feel pretty good. But if inflation was 4%, uh, you probably ignore that. Whereas if you got a 2% pay cut and inflation was zero, you're going to feel pretty bad because you've got a pay cut. In real terms, they're both exactly the same thing. So he's saying that you know, nominally we think, oh, I've got a 2% pay rise and you feel good. But if inflation's 4%, it's the exact same as getting a 2% pay cut with zero inflation. So you've got to be careful between the nominal and the real. So say if, you, if you're making a 10% return on your stock portfolio, but inflation's 8%, you've really only made 2% there. He says over a 50-year period between 1960 and 2005, uh, 69% of the world's capitalistic countries have suffered at least one year of inflation of 25%. That's fucking so wild. Feds, That's one year. Oh, That's absolutely, crazy. man. So Feds around the world, this is something they try and keep in the bag, but sometimes people can't control inflation and it just goes out. And then obviously in, in, in a year where there was 25% inflation, you might look at your stock portfolio and think, holy shit, I made 18% return this year, which is massive compared to the average 6 to 8%. But when inflation is 25%, you're actually lost. So another useful thing about inflation though, on the other side of the equation, you know, so if you've got cash, if inflation goes up, that means the, the value of your cash has gone down. But if, on the other side of the, the equation, if you've got debt, the value of that debt also goes down. So if the price of a dollar is less next year, that means the debt now you have now is going to be less next year, mm. even though you haven't paid anything off. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a strategy that governments use as well. When they're in so much debt, they use inflation to make the, the debt costs less in the future. It's a cheeky way to do it, but uh, mate, if I had a bit of control, I'd probably do the same thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a good way to, to decrease your debt. It's good for debt. <laughs> Another thing that he talks about is this idea that you can find a really, really great asset, but it can still be a bad buy. So again, when you buy anything what you think is an asset, you're buying something with some kind of perceived value and that uh, justifies what price it is. And if you pay above what the really justifiable price is, then you're getting ripped off. Hmm. It's a little bit like he uses the example of Michael Jordan. So when the Chicago Bulls bought Jordan at $34 million and he went off and just nailed all these championships for him, they thought it was probably justifiable paying that much. But if they paid Michael Jordan $300 million a year, it's probably not worth it. So what he's saying here is that it, you can buy an extremely good asset, but it can still be overpriced. So good assets can be overpriced. Yeah, exactly. So it's important to realize that there's no such thing as a good buy all the time. There's no company that you should definitely just buy all the time at any price because sometimes it can be overpriced, meaning it's a bad investment. And one important uh, ratio, one thing to look at, he calls the PE, is the price earnings ratio. So it's the price of the stock divided by the earnings per share. And so he says it's safe that if a stock's at $10 and it's earning $1 per share, then the price earnings ratio is 10. And then obviously if it's a earning, if it's priced at $100 and it's earning $1 per share, then the PE is 100. And so he says that over time, there's these ranges of what is a good PE ratio and what's a over overly ridiculous PE ratio. Yeah, that's it. So if your P on E is 10, it's only going to take you 10 years of dividends to pay what the initial investment was. If it's 70, that means it's going to take 70 years of dividends to pay what the initial price was. So you want it to be as low as possible. And as we were saying earlier, things can be overpriced. And he thinks, Benjamin Graham says, any P on E above 20 is expensive. Anything between 10 and 20 is moderate. And anything below 10 is very cheap and something to go for. No, so what we've talked about so far is a bit of an intro into the world of investment and speculation and some of the basics that we need to get our head around like inflation and price earnings ratios. What he does next is he talks about the two different approaches to investing. Uh, one approach is what he calls the defensive investor and the second approach is what he calls the enterprising investor. So importantly, firstly, the defensive investor, it's someone who's unwilling to put in the time and effort. Uh, so instead of taking an active approach, you seek to take a portfolio that has minimal effort, minimal research, minimal monitoring. It's basically a defensive thing that you can, it's almost a set and forget, something you can set up 
and buy it and you don't have to worry about knowing a whole lot of stuff about the market. And I can imagine this is for most people listening, you know, who just want to be weekend yeah. warriors, um, don't want to spend every day when they get home from work, four hours a day, checking the stock prices, checking publicly available information and so forth. You just want to set it and forget it and then maybe maintain it, you know, a few times a year at most. So it's got a whole bunch of different rules and frameworks you can follow if this sounds like you. Yeah, part of the portfolio he talks about building is not just stocks, but also bonds. And he says that a defensive investor is probably should get close to 50% stocks and 50% bonds and definitely no less or no more than 25% or 75% of each. So you should have uh, between 25% stocks, 75% bonds and 75%, 25% bonds. If you're going outside that range, your portfolio is way out of whack. You need to rebalance closer to 50-50. So what bonds are is when either the government or a big large company want to actually borrow money so they can actually borrow money from you. And when say they uh, a bond price is you know 100 bucks or something and then you lend them the $100, then you also get a return which they call the uh, coupon rate. So if a $100 bond, they might say a 6% coupon rate over 10 years. That means over 10 years, you're going to get 6% or $6 per year up until the end of that 10-year period. And then when that 10-year period is done, you'll also get your 100 bucks back. So you get 6% every year and the 100 bucks back at the end. And so this is really considered a very safe bet. You know you know exactly what you're going to get in the future. And, so, and bonds are a debt instrument, whereas stocks are an equity instrument. So what it means is like stocks, you're buying a percentage of the company overall, whereas bonds, in a simplistic way, you're giving the company a loan in a matter of speaking. And uh, one good thing, I guess, is that bonds, say if the company crashes, debt gets paid out first, equity gets paid out last, which makes bonds safer than shares because you're going to get paid out first if it all goes wrong. And also, as you say, like you, it's very consistent. You know exactly what you're going to get each and every year. And at the end, you know what you're going to get as well. So when it comes to bonds, the riskier the, 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 the lender is, the higher yield you're going to get as well. So if a, a shitty company who doesn't have a good track record or anything is lending out money, there's probably a good chance that they're not going to pay it, uh, be able to pay it back. So they're going to have to offer a higher coupon yield and interest rate on that bond to actually suck you guys in to actually uh, lend them the money. Yeah, when you compare that to the government, which is meant to be extremely, extremely safe, you're going to get a much, much, much lower uh, yield on that. And now bonds and interest rates uh, are at opposite ends of the seesaw. So when interest rates rise, the value of the bond effectively falls and vice versa. And some of the reasons for that is that... Uh, Firstly, is that your, if interest rates go up and you've got your fixed payment, so if, if interest rates go up a couple of percent but your 6% yield is fixed, it means that what you're getting fixed is, is effectively worth less than what you could get in the market now. So because your interest, because interest rates have gone up and you could get more interest elsewhere, then the value of your bond has effectively decreased. That's it. So when the government is issuing the new bonds, they can't issue at 6%. They're issuing bonds now at 8%. So everyone's jumping into the new bonds rather than the old ones. So that means the value of the when you purchase has actually gone down. So when interest rates fall, the opposite is true. That means the new bonds they're issuing have got lower returns. And that means when you got it before, the new bonds are coming in, you got it at a better price. That means the price of your bond's going to go up. So it's counter-cyclical with our interest rates. Yeah, and it's important to note, you still get the exact same money. You still get your 6% every year. You still get your 100 bucks at the end, but it's saying that that is worth... If you, were try, if you were to try to sell that bond to someone, you might be only able to sell that bond for 95 bucks because they realize they could get a better return somewhere else. As you laid out at the start, man, um, you want to be about 25 to 75 in that range, so 25% bonds or stocks and to 75% bonds or stocks we just laid out a bit of information about bonds and how, how to invest in that um, and next he talks about what stocks you should be investing in if you're the defensive investor the weekend warrior type so a few rules for looking at setting up your portfolio firstly you need adequate diversification so he says that you need some of it at least between 10 to 30 different big stocks but importantly you're going to probably want to go towards an index fund which captures all of the investments worth having mm. Another rule is you need to stick to large, outstanding, conservative companies. So he's saying that the top one or one to three companies in an industry or group. So we're talking like a, a word for this is blue chip. You want your big, safe, blue chip, conservative companies. 
You also want at least 20 years of consistent dividend payments because remember that in investing rather than speculating, we're looking for that consistent dividend income. And also you need to limit the price that you're willing to pay. So coming back to that PE ratio, you don't want to be paying say more than 20 times price to earnings. Mm. So the thing all these strategies have in common, it's really uh, minimizing the amount of risk that you have in uh, your portfolio so you can go to sleep at night knowing that nothing wild is going to happen whilst you sleep and you wake up and you, you know, your, your wife's left you or your husband's <laughs> left you and the kid's gone and you're selling <laughs> wedding rings and so forth. You're pretty safe. So one of the things you laid out at the start there was the idea of buying an index fund which is a really good idea of diversifying your whole stock portfolio. Uh, I mean, back in the day when Benjamin Graham was writing, you know, you might have to handpick 30 big stocks, but now you can actually buy 500 stocks in the one one swing. Uh, and so rather than finding the needle in the haystack of the one good company who's going to be Amazon, you actually buy the whole haystack. So you buy all the shit companies plus the Amazons. But over time, your whole, you're, you're buying the whole return of the market, uh, you know, the average of the whole market. And so the point with the defensive investor here, as we said, it's not a massive commitment in terms of time, energy and knowledge, but you should be able to do enough here with some of these rules in terms of picking the big safe companies that are giving consistent dividends and diversifying into buying the whole market. You should be able to get more return from your portfolio as opposed to just sticking it in the bank and getting like a 1% uh, return on your savings interest. So he's saying that's your defensive investor there in terms of conservative, but in terms of beating your regular return that you would get from just cash savings. And I'd say that's what probably like 95% of people are going to do unless you're willing to put in all the extra time and effort that it requires to become an enterprising investor, which is the next type of person we'll talk about. So that's for those listening who are willing to spend a lot more time and energy into actually finding uh, the right stocks to, to beat the overall market. So, as suggested, it requires constant attention, constant monitoring. Monitoring, you know, she'll put extra effort required for dynamic portfolio management, research, and selection of individual investment. Yeah, so it's, you need to have the willingness to take that extra effort required, put in the time to get the experience and get a little bit of uh, guidance as well into expanding your universe of potential opportunities beyond just the conservative investments of the defensive portfolio. So one of the things you can do as an enterprising investor that you can't as an, a defensive investor, according to Benjamin, is you can actually invest in growth stocks. So a growth stock is one of those companies that are really small, growing really fast. And, and because it's such a small company growing fast, the P on an E ratio and things like this might be a little bit out of whack because a little bit, a little bit is based on uh, hope about what it's going to be in the future. So there's a speculative element to it. So if you're the type who can research such a stock, you understand when it, it's actually overpriced or underpriced based on the, the four projected uh, earnings of what it's going to be. Yeah, so the growth stocks won't form too much of the defensive investor's portfolio, but that's what the enterprising investor is going to look for in order to try to um, achieve higher rate of return. Another one is buying bargains. So sometimes you could find a stock that is saying less for its intrinsic value one thing might be that if a certain company cops a lot of bad press or bad publicity and everyone thinks, oh, this company's going down the gurgle and they sell, 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 mm -hmm. and there's probably, they're probably going to overdo it. And if you can recognize that everybody else is overreacting and overselling and you think, hang on, it's not as bad as they think and now it's cheap because everybody sold it, that's a bargain that you can buy as long as you're confident that you sort of, you know, you know that everybody's just overreacting, which people do do if everyone thinks that the sky's falling and they start selling. There's probably mm. going to be a bargain opportunity there potentially for an enterprising investor. Yeah, it probably works the other way as well when all the positive, uh, you know, positive press about a company or something probably gets overpriced through all the hype and hype and hype and so forth. I think a good current example is probably Tesla in that there, there's a lot of hype around Tesla and around Elon Musk, but it's also the stock price is extremely... Um, fluctuating in terms of news and stuff you know he goes on joe rogan and smokes a joint and it, all of a sudden the whole company is oh. about to fucking fall apart <laughs> like that's just so ridiculous that every, it dropped so much and for an enterprising investor that thinks what the fuck that's yeah. such a ridiculous thing to sell your stock on got nothing to do with the company that's probably a bargain time it's uh i actually own a tiny bit of tesla and 
uh, before reading this book, I thought, oh, it's a great investment. Yeah. But right now, I understand it's pure, pure <laughs> speculation. <Yeah>. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> he talks about P on E ratios. Tesla doesn't even have a P on E ratio. <laughs> there's, there's no, no earnings. <laughs> there's no earnings. <laughs> it's infinity. <laughs> it's infinity. There you Man, go. That is wild. That, that is, uh, you've got to be careful with stuff like that. That's for sure. So, I do understand why so many people are shorting Tesla because based on Benjamin Graham's principles, it's a stupid investment. They probably shouldn't be priced what they are right now. Now, you've got to be careful with this enterprising investor that you can never think that you know more than the market and that specific timing is difficult, if not impossible. And Benjamin Graham quotes Alan Greenspan in 1973, who eventually was the, the head of uh, the Federal Reserve. Uh, and he quoted in 1973, it's very rare that you could be as unreservedly bullish as you can right now. So Greenspan saying, it's good. The market's looking phenomenal. The future's looking grassy then go ahead and buy, 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 be bullish, bullish, bullish. And he said the next two years after that were the biggest bear market since the Great Depression. <laughs> and you think Alan Greenspan should know what he's talking about, yeah. but he, even he can't time the market that well. I'm sure it was the same before the 2008 crisis. A lot oh, yeah. of the mainstream news was talking that, and there'll be maybe a select few talking about, nah, it's a bubble, it's a bubble, it's a bubble. Then it was a bubble. Yeah. And then some of these contrarian people, they were talking the bubble since then as well yeah but then the mainstream people are right you know what i mean it's like uh no one can really time the market and it's a bit of a bruise on the ego when you have to realize that yeah most certainly so in order to still we're still looking for good stocks here for the enterprising investor uh and so he says a few things you need to look for is firstly a bit of again strong financial condition so he says that current assets should be at least 1.5 times current liabilities and total debt to net current assets ratio should be less than 1.1. So again, these are just a few of the financial ratios that you could easily find for a, a given company. And you got to be, obviously, you want assets to be a lot more mm. than liabilities. You want earning stability. So that means positive earnings over the last five years. You want it to currently pay a dividend, mm. aka not Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> and you want stock price to be less than 120% of tangible assets, meaning that the stock isn't overpriced based on what its assets are as well. Yeah, net tangible assets means if they thought we're going to stop doing everything we do, we're going to sell everything, sell all the factories, sell everything we own, then how much have you got left? That's your net tangible assets. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying obviously if the stock price is way, 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 way more than that, then uh, there there's a lot be, of risk in yeah, there. <laughs> there's a lot of risk in there. So a few things, that's in terms of the financial side of things, the numbers side of things. He says you should also be looking to, I guess, the company and the industry as a whole. So one thing is that's good for a company to buy is a wide moat or a competitive advantage, a bit like a bit of a blue ocean strategy in that this company is really good at what they do and it's very hard for other competitors to come in and take them down. So they've got a, a competitive moat around them, he says. So things that widen the moat, uh, companies with a strong brand identity like Harley, that's not going to go down. If they've got a monopoly or a near monopoly on things, or if they're using the economies of scale, meaning that it's really a huge barrier of barrier to entry for the little guy to come in and compete with them. Another important thing for a company is that they're a marathoner, not a sprinter. So they're not just trying to make a whole lot of money in the next one or two years. They're looking long term, not just short term. And another one he says that they sow as well as reap. So they're not just constantly about making money or they're not just constantly about investing for the future. They're making money now, but they're also investing and doing a bit of R&D for future growth as well. So they're all the good things about a company to look out for. There's a few things that you should really avoid in companies. One being the company is a serial acquirer. I mean, if they're making two or three acquisitions a year, it's a sign of potential trouble. I mean, they're following the suit of growth by acquisition. Yeah, another one is uh, they're an OPM addict, not OPM, OPM, other people's money. And he says that, you know, if you're constantly looking to debt and borrowing, that's probably not a good sign where they should be generating their own cash. Another one he says they shouldn't be a Johnny One Note, which he says they shouldn't just rely on one specific customer or one small cluster of customers to make a big chunk of their revenue. If you're if fifty percent of your revenue comes from one company, you're extremely, extremely, extremely reliant on that other company as doing it as well. That's it, man. So that's the enterprising investor and how they should uh, go about their things if they want to try and beat the market. One thing he suggests at the end of the book, and this is for, uh, I guess, the enterprising and the defensive investor, is he suggests to go out and pay a fee 
for real uh, investment advice from a financial planner. There's a lot of crocker shit out there from financial planners and advisors that don't know what they're doing. And in Australia, especially in the last couple of years, have really come under fire for a lot of shit advice. Mm. But he says that if you can find a good advisor that doesn't um, charge a whole bunch of money for stuff and not provide you value, it can be really important. And there's a few signs that you might need an advisor. He says if you ever lose more than 25% of your portfolio, you fucked up somewhere and you should get a, an advisor. If your budget's are way out of whack and you can't sort of make ends meet in your day-to-day budgeting and you're fueled by credit, you're struggling to get to the end of your pay cycle, then you've definitely done something wrong in terms of over-allocating assets to your portfolio. If your portfolio is chaotic, you know, maybe... He says that in the 90s, people thought that they had a diversified portfolio because they had 50 different internet stocks, but Mm. that's not diversified just because they got a lot of different companies. Yeah, you need to diversify in industry, not just in companies. And another big one is just if you've got any major life changes, a new job, marriage, divorce, kids, new house, these are all big times where a bit of advice from a professional could come in handy. Yeah, that's some good uh, big Benjamin Graham advice there. Toward the end, he really just slaps you over the head with some big bangers. These are some real big bangers. Whether you're a defensive investor, whether you're an enterprising investor, or whether you're just a 19-year-old Adam Ashton who thinks he's a fucking (laughs) stock market genius. Or a 26-year-old Adam Ashton who thinks you're... (laughs) There are a few important uh, bangers here at the end, a few questions to really ask and carefully consider. These are good questions, not just for stocks and bonds, but also, you know, property or anything. It's like you get to ask yourself, what is the likelihood that my analysis is right? You get to ask yourself, how much experience do I have? What is my track record with similar decisions? What is the track record of other people who have tried this? Yeah, that comes back to a bit of the Euro bear. Greg Sack had a good uh, track record with a Euro bear. And then... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you found out that the hard way, didn't you? <laughs> and then he's got some... This is the real big slap-up banger. If I'm buying and someone else is selling, how likely is it that I know something more than this other person who's selling? Yeah, it's an important con- uh, question to consider because every transaction is based on there's a buyer and there's a seller. Mm. If you're buying because you think there's really good prospects, somebody else is selling it because they think the opposite. So, you really got to weigh up. Do you know more than them? Do they know something you don't? Do you know something they don't? Like you really got to consider Mm. why are they selling right now? And yeah, it's important to factor both sides into decision making. Because if you're a weekend warrior person, you think you're so smart buying a stock, you get to think the other person could be someone who actually spends their whole lifetime researching and, and finding out things. And if that other person knows more and is selling it and you think you're so smart buying it, then there's probably a few issues going on. So it's something you got to, to uh, have a bit of humility about. Yeah, most definitely. I think it's that's super important. I think um, the he he doesn't really skew to one way or the other, defensive or enterprising. I think the he's definitely obviously more towards the enterprising side. But I definitely caution anybody out there who reads uh, one book or listens to one podcast and think that they they can go out and invest. Uh, if you're going to do it, then commit a serious amount of time mm. and energy and research into. If you're going to go enterprising, it takes a lot. You can't just think you know everything and go for Absolutely, it. Absolutely, man. It's a long road because. Uh, if you, as we say, if you're buying someone else's selling, the other person might have 50 years experience. And if you're someone who's just bought one book and thinks you, uh, you know, that's who you're going up against, right? So it's going to be a long road of maybe potential losses until you get to the experience of someone else who's going to actually beat the market over time. That said, this book is definitely a good one to start with if you want to become uh, an intelligent investor. Learn from Buffett. Learn from Buffett's master. It's probably a good good place to start your financial education. Thanks for listening. As a reminder, we've just completed our updated edition for our top 50 best books of all time. You can grab and learn the best bits from the best books at whatyouwillearn.com slash top 50, T-O-P 50.